Okay, hi, welcome everybody. Um, I'll get, get started now. Um, thanks to ev everyone for joining. Um, so this is the uh, 13th and, well, that's very unlucky, should have jumped 14th anyway, um, we'll go with it. The 13th um, seminar of the Contemporary Women's Writing and Medical Humanities um, series. Uh, the title of this seminar is Neurology and Psychiatry, Female Experiences of Mind Doctors. Um, so this seminar is organized um, in, uh, with the support of the Centre for Contemporary Women's Writing at the Institute of Modern Languages Research in London. Um, this series for postgraduates and early career researchers seeks to explore or has sought to explore how contemporary women's writing in particular, be this fiction, poetry, autobiographical or philosophical writing, is currently engaging with issues such as illness, disease, healthcare, medical practice and clinical institutions. Um, there have been there has been a wide range of themes um, covered uh, throughout the past twelve um, seminars, and um, our seminar series has um, rather in a lovely way has extended into our uh, seminar uh, into our seminar sorry into our conference. There we go, get it right this time. Into our conference at the end of July, which will also be online, um, and it's also t entitled "Contemporary Women's Writing and the Medical Humanities." Um, there will be uh, more information coming out uh, soon about the program for that, but we have like a full, nearly full three days of um, papers and, mul and parallel panels that we've had a huge range of, um, you know, interesting research coming through. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that. And I will um, put the link to the Twitter account in the chat in just a sec so you can keep track of all the news of the conference. Um, okay, so... Um, we, as I said um, right at the beginning, this is our last uh, last seminar of this series. Uh, we started in September 2020 and we've had fortnightly um, seminars on a whole range of themes. If you'd like to watch any of the past ones or you can catch up, you can, you know, check out the IMLR iPlayer in a way and see all the recordings because um, all of them are recorded and uploaded. Um, and I'll also put the link to that in the chat in a sec. Okay, so um, in terms of Zoom house rules for today, um, so this session is being recorded. Uh, so it will be uploaded to the IMLR website in the coming week. Um, please feel free to keep your cameras on, off and on, whichever you feel is most comfortable. We'll be having three 15-minute um, papers and then a Q&A session at the end. If you could all remain on mute um, during the papers um, until the Q&A session, that would be most appreciated. Um, during the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to use the raise hand icon um, option on Zoom. And then either Ben or I will ask you to unmute. Um, the raise the hand icon is found through uh, clicking on participants and then your own name and then there's an option to um, raise hand kind of at the bottom of the participants window. Um, you can also type your questions into the chat so if you type question and then maybe uh, who the, the question is directed at so um, the name of one of our speakers and then Ben and I can either uh, read it out for you or you can a uh, section. Um, you can add your questions as and when you like throughout the papers, you know, when inspiration hits and, or you can wait until the Q and A um, as you prefer. So um, another thing that we've been doing the past couple of um, seminars is um, kind of like live um, audio um, closed caption transcription. So you should be able to see that at the bottom of the screen. Now, if you can't, if you go on the bottom of the Zoom window um, where the kind of uh, the mute, um, mute participants, etc. kind of icons are. There's one that says CC live transcript. And if you click on live immediate transcript, it should come up. Um, we'll also be doing something called um, auto description. Um, so when I've kind of finished my spiel, I'll describe myself. And then um, Ben, who's doing introducing the speakers will also describe himself and our speakers will as well, as well as any visuals on their PowerPoints during their presentations. Um, yeah, so uh, I am a, just my audio, auto description, I'm a 29 year old white British woman with kind of brown blondish hair and a plaid gold glasses and like a short sleeve black shirt with like blue and green fruit on it today. <laughs> yeah, very exciting stuff going on. All right, so I'll pass over to Ben. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, Becky. Um, I'll just quickly audio describe myself. I'm wearing a um, greyish, bluish shirt and I'm a 29 year old um, man with, uh, so, oh my god I'm not 29 actually, I'm 30 now and I've got a, um, a brown beard and brown hair, um, yes. So anyway, um, I'll get on with it. Uh, so first up we have uh, James uh, Rakowski uh, who completed a PhD in literature and the medical humanities at King's College London. 
His thesis focuses on the mixed media making and strategies of illness life writing in works constellated around neurological injury and disorder from 1990 to the present. He runs a research seminar working group entitled Configurations of Empire in conjunction with University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His first publication, Moving Without Movement, Merleau-Ponty's Mer Mer I Can and Memoirs of Bodily Immobility is forthcoming with SUNY Press. I don't know whether you just say SUNY or S-U-N-Y, but there we go. And um, James's paper today is called Cahalan's Double Binds, Reflex, Advocacy and Self-Making in Memoirs of Brain Encephalitis. Thanks very much, Jamie. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly audio describe myself. Um, I am a white, uh, not also 29, uh, I am 29, not 30. Um, uh, I, I've got very long lockdown hair, uh, about four days of stubble, and I'm wearing a uh, sort of turtle, turtle shell with gold rims uh, glasses. Um, I'm going to share my screen, if I can. Here we go. Okay, so my paper is uh, called Cahalan's Double Binds, Advocacy and Self-Making in Memoirs of Brain Encephalitis. In it, I want to offer a formalistic claim about contemporary illness life writing that will try to make sense of the sense of stuckness and non-futurity that haunts contemporary life. To do this, I will offer a brief history of a surprisingly recent concept. This is the double bind, coined by anthropologist Gregory Bateson in 1956, which connotes a situation where a person suffers due to only being able to choose between a series of conflicting and harmful commands or options. I want to think especially about how the double bind shows up in strange places, across sites of feminist activism and neurological patient advocacy, and what this overdetermined and transposable quality of the double binds might tell us. I'm not interested in the logical resolution of double binds, because I think binds thwart the possibility of resolution and undermine the pretense of logic anyway. Instead, I'm interested in the affective and cognitive life of doubly bound dilemmas, the anxieties, distresses and depressions that accompany being affronted with an impossible problem. So I'm going to focus my discussion on how the double bind is made manifest in a single work of contemporary women's life writing. This is New York-based journalist Susanna Cahalan's memoir of her autoimmune encephalitis, Brain on Fire, My Month of Madness. And here I have a, um, uh, a slide which actually has a photograph of my own copy, my own well-worn copy. Um, the sort of the book cover have is, has, has a sort of grey tone image of a white blonde a uh, young looking woman, um, and the, there's black text on a yellow background. There's also a sticker saying soon to be a major motion picture, which there was, uh, came out I think in 2016, starring Chloe Grace Moretz. I don't know if anybody saw it. It is on Netflix. Uh, I'm not 100% sure I'd recommend it. Um, so Cahalan's memoir depicts an episode of brain encephalitis which does not lead, lead to lasting neurodebilitation or disability. Nevertheless, the after effects of being confronted with absence, with the void occasioned by encephalitis, continues to haunt Cahalan's writing strategies beyond her convalescence. Cahalan's prose is what a neurobiologist might describe as lucid, yet it is through the incongruities which emerge from the production of this lucidity that Cahalan's text, I argue, discloses the knotted pervasiveness which an encounter with a brain on fire delimits. So I'm going to present my analysis of Cahalan's memoir through an examination of how the text articulates two double binds. First, I will consider the double bind that emerges through Cahalan's use of neurology to advocate for encephalitis patients. I will explore the feminist stakes of how Cahalan rejects the psychological and consider these stakes in the light of how memoirs of neurological catastrophe encounter in all sorts of dangerously immediate ways the vicissitudes of brain-centric subjectivity. The second double bind I will consider is the one that emerges from the remarkable fact that Cahalan cannot remember her illness experience. Brain on Fire is a memoir which relies, therefore, on the material apparatuses of clinical, neuroscientific and journalistic resources to construct the authorial subject position of a healthy individual retrieving her neurologically sick self. It is the overlapping of these two double binds, which is kind of the the main point I'm hoping to gesture towards this evening or this afternoon 
Uh, how is it that the double bind as a sort of contorted shape of lived experience has become so pervasive for both the oppressed and the sick of this world? Okay, so first, a very, very brief history of the double binds. As I mentioned, the double bind was first identified by anthropologist Gregory Bateson. And I have here a slide, um, another great tone photograph of Bateson approaching older age, um, wearing uh, quite a scruffy shirt, I think with glasses in the top pocket and a checkered fleece. So the double bind was initially posited by Bateson as an explanation for the emergence of psychiatric symptoms associated with schizophrenia. Bateson hypothesized that such conditions were made possible when individuals faced repeated communicational conflicts, particularly from childhood. The ingredients, that's Bateson's term, of such circumstances are not only that an individual receives conflicting communication from one or more persons, but that these conflicting communications take place in a scenario or context where that person then feels they cannot escape or leave. The gradual consequence is that they start to, and I'm quoting, uh, perceive the universe in double bind patterns. However, what I really want to highlight here is the leakiness of the double bind concept in Bateson's own thinking a leakiness that becomes perceptible when we attend to 1972's Steps to an Ecology of Minds, which collates published work written by Bateson over four decades. Over these decades, we can witness what I've come to think of as an originary fable for the double bind. Its explanatory power expands almost exponentially to encompass, in turn, interspecies interaction, addiction and alcoholism, then the whole enterprise of therapy itself, and finally, as a characteristic which governs all subject organisms, as well as the socio-ecological systems in which they live. I think it is quite reasonable to therefore ask what allows Bateson to have become so entangled with his own concepts, and equally, uh, what has allowed the double bind to have slipped so easily into common parlance. I have a sort of slide here using like the extremely unscientific uh, method of a Google Engram viewer but it, it just sort of plots a graph of the sort of the use of the double bind in published works from about kind of 1945 and sort of shows, you know, nothing before. And then it suddenly, there's a strange blip in 2008. Um, I don't know what that's about, but we can sort of, the broad point is it's, it's a popular word, a popular term. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about Marilyn Fry in detail now, but I would like to sort of draw out the quotation uh, which sort of radical feminist Marilyn Fry says about the double bind, which is that it's one of the most ubiquitous features of the world as experienced by oppressed people. Uh, that this sort of double bind is a situation in which options are reduced to a very few and all of them expose one to penalty, censure or deprivation. Um, and sort of Marilyn Fry just kind of represents one example of, I, I think this like extraordinary theoretical purchase that the term has had. So um, we also have, and I have a slide here, um, of the sort of Marxist autonomous philosopher, uh, Franco Bifo Berardi. Um, it's a coloured photograph. Uh, he's got a shock of white grey hair, black uh, circular glasses. Um, and so for Bifo, the double bind is a pathogenic mechanism produced by the conditions of late capitalism. The worker is preconditioned to always run out of options to always be considered a failure and to be failed by the system of misunderstandings, contradictory injunctions and perverse juxtapositions which deliberatively make up the social fabric of post-neoliberal everyday life. The double bind signposts how late capitalism has surpassed or negated the possibility of dialectic. Um, and I think this sort of idea of BFOs expresses that idea of non-futurity, which I gestured to at the start of this talk. And then we also have the work of Gatry Spivak, and I have here uh, another great tone photograph of Spivak sat on the floor as she gave a seminar at Goldsmith College. Um, Spivak wants us to notice how Bateson's double bind spells a kind of trouble for experience that is at once political as it is therapeutic and embodied. Spivak's own application of the double bind is to re-describe her own earlier accounts of the problems faced by those who must adopt what she terms strategic essentialism, that is disenfranchised activists who are compelled to embody identities in order to further communitar communitarian or political goals. This strategic essentialism, Spivak writes, is a species of the double bind because it is a case of having to render your conscious experience 
as something that moves from one site of difficulty to another. It's a survival through this oscillation between total social expulsion and identitarian rigidity. And it's this Bivakian double bind that I want to sort of stay with first in relation to Kalen's brain on fire. So I'm returning to the sort of the cover image um, of, of Kahalan's book here, this time accompanied with the book's dedication. I want to draw attention to how this dedication dedicated to those without a diagnosis um, is, is a sort of soul sentence situated on the top right hand side of an otherwise blank page. I want to consider the stakes of what we might consider, or what we might call rather, the advocacy function of contemporary illness life writing the way in which composing an illness memoir might be about trying to articulate a message otherwise disarticulated by the biomedical or health policy establishments. Slovak herself offers the patient activist as an exemplary figure of the double bind. The patient activist understands perfectly that their patient role renders them as a passivity within harmful healthcare industries, but they nevertheless seek to take on that role in order to be recognized by the system which they seek to critique or transform. In Cahalan's case, her memoir advocates for sufferers um, of a condition called anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, a rare brain disease diagnosed, identified only in uh, 2008. Neurologist Hiroshi Irani notes how this form of encephalitis is distinguished by its prominent psychiatric symptoms, and the memoir presents an expose of how Cahalan's serious neurological disorder was misdiagnosed multiple times as psychiatric. A doctor labelled her as being an overdrinker, then as an overworker. Um, she was sort of diagnosed with a sort of sequence of personality disorders. And finally, in kind of really late stages of the neurological condition, uh, she was diagnosed with psychosis. So the memoir is structured into three parts. Part one is titled Crazy. Part two's title refers to a key moment of diagnosis, the clock and part three to a period of convalescence and remembrance, which Cahalan names after Proust in search of lost time. This central narrative therefore implies a degree disease progression from psychiatric misdiagnosis to neurological interpolation. It also situates autoimmune encephalitis into a long history of gender disparity in biomedical diagnostics. Women's, that, that is women's bodies being incorporated into misleading taxonomies by healthcare systems. The longer a diagnosis of autoimmune infection of the brain is delayed, the greater the chance of permanent brain injury. And Cahalan notes that 7% of cases of anti-NMDA are encephalitis result in death. It is precisely this life and death urgency, which means that Cahalan must disown psychological and phenomenological descriptions of herself in order for herself and others like her to be heard within a medical system that would not listen otherwise. Cahalan writes elsewhere that because her madness was curable, that's, that's her quotation madness, and correlated with an organic disease, she had been able to conceptualize her illness as something wholly other, something separate from myself. These invocations of the neurobiological provide Cahalan with the tools to posit the behavior of her sick self as exclusively a result of an inflamed brain. And in doing so, Brain on Fire urges for one uniform look at, quote, mental illnesses as the neurochemical diseases that they are. It is consequently difficult to characterize Cahalan's work as either a reactionary or progressive political project, coupled as, it, coupled as it is with a complicity towards neurological correlation that may occlude many of those without a diagnosis, which the text wishes to include. Then the second double bind I wish to highlight is one that also relates towards a desire for the language of neurology. This occurs in the wake of neuropathological conditions or injuries, as patients become adept at explaining their altered lived experiences and capacities through neuroclinical vocabulary. This can be seen in Cahalan's memoir, uh, for instance, where she explains away a constant chewing motion and involuntary grimace she experienced during her illness. And I'm quoting here. At the top of the spinal cord and at the underside of the brain is the brainstem, one of the more primitive parts of the brain, which helps oversee basic life or death functions. A thumb-sized cluster of cells in the brainstem, called the medulla, manages blood pressure, heart rate and breathing. A bulging area nearby, the pons, plays an important role in the control of facial expressions. So it made sense 
that my symptoms might be coming from this area. In brain injury scholarship, the imperative for patients to use this sort of language is frequently considered an unquestioned good, not only by clinicians, but by those working in qualitative health research as well. Clinical psychologist Joshua Cantor, for example, observes that many patients struggle to navigate between their pre-traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic brain injury selves, and this leads to depressive and anxious states. Cantor suggests that this can be countered by patients learning to tell a story about how neurological change has produced these discrepancies. However, this account of discrepancy and accounts like it, which posit narrative or writing or composition or pathography as an attempt to recohere or settle disparate dimensions of the self, do not adequately encompass the complexity of all that occurs in brain injury life writing texts. So it was kind of within this problem that I then encountered the work of Masahiro Noki, who's, I have an image, I have a photograph of him, uh, which I maybe weirdly pulled from his academia strategy profile. Um, and Masahiro Noki sort of agrees that attempts to make sense of brain injury to fill the void of the past involves telling a reasonable and useful story of causal relationship between the brain injury and later difficulties in life. However, he then suggests that these self-explanations in turn create a different void within the present self. And this is a quotation. When one assumes the dysfunction of the brain can influence one's mind and self, one holds another agent within oneself. It is beyond one's control, although it exists inside one's body. The person then carries something unknown in his or her sense of self, which involves knowledge about what he or she can do. And it is in this way that brain injury becomes a crisis of the self, operating at the level of a double bind, because the resources available to get out of a harmful situation are themselves harmful resources. So it's from this disposition then that I want to disclose the compositional complexity of Kurt Cahalan's Brain on Fire. Against the interviews, publishing, film adaptations and advocacy which followed her encephalitis, Cahalan remembers little of her ordeal. Cahalan's memoir instead reconsolidates and reclaims the conditions of her forgotten encephalitis experience by presenting her writing as a series of embodied strategies, self-reflexive attempts by the text to find its lost sick subject, to identify with her, using the representational tools with which the recovered Cahalan was left with. This is footage from surveillance cameras in an epilepsy ward, handwritten notes, treatment documents, and journalistic interview skills. So I've got a few examples here. Um, there's a sort of a, a photocopy of notes um, that she made during a consultation, which she has no memory of, but she has the notes. So this was sort of in her notebook. Uh, there's a sort of notes at the bottom. There's this kind of interesting formulation of uh, my brain, my inflamed, um, which a review that Leslie Jameson gave of the book uh, makes sort of much stock of. Also got sort of photocopies of her check-in records. Uh, there's a sort of reproduced image of a, of a sort of lopsided clock drawing, um, which sort of proved pretty pivotal in the sort of diagnosis of an infection in the right hemisphere of her brain, and a slide that, and a photograph of a slide of a biopsy sample, um, too. So Cahalan describes this process of archival retrieval as an exhumation, a metaphor which equates her sick self with death. It is a form of death which must re-emerge into social life for investigative or juridical reasons. And this, def this ambivalence about death, that is the gesture to simultaneously dismiss and incorporate her sick self, perfectly encapsulates how Cahalan's excessive negotiations with mixed media, with what medical humanities critic Stella Balaki might call her crea critical creative acts of making, can be read as a reckoning with the double bind structuring her existence. This is a text constantly unsettling its own grounds with its use of these kinds of materials. Cahalan's prodromal, sick, convalescent and writing cells fold in upon each other in confusing meshes of self and other referencing pronouns. In passages dedicated to, to the surveillance footage from her unremembered stay on an epilepsy ward, for instance, Cahalan inverts her metaphorical gambit by instead just re-describing the camera and therefore the viewer's gaze as death. So on the screen, I stare straight ahead, lying my back as rigid as a statue, my eyes the only features betraying the manic fear inside. Then those eyes turn and concentrate on the camera 
on me now. There I am, staring into the camera as if I'm looking death in the face. I've never seen myself so unhinged and unguarded before, and it frightens me. Please, I see myself plead on video again. Maybe I can help her. Um, and I want to kind of wrap up on that note, because I think that invocation of the maybe um, is a note which sounds out from our invocation within deep sets of insoluble problems. This is the illness memoir as a genre of maybe, um, a, a kind of conditional imperfect, <laughs> um, possibly already failed, but give it a go anyway, disposition, um, the remainder of an echo of a possibility to act and to care, a survival through oscillation. Um, and I'm done. Thanks so much, James. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, obviously, I've got loads of uh, questions I'd love to ask you about about all of that, like having worked on uh, Malibu and brain injury, and obviously you're coming at it from a very different uh, perspective. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, I don't know, we'll get some time to talk about that at some point. Um, so next we have uh, Eliza. Um, so Eliza Toledo. So uh, Eliza did her license, licence and MA in history at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, uh, UFMG, the latter with a dissertation, A Vida Sexual by Igas uh, Monith, um, A Medical Scientific Discourse About the Sex Bodies. PhD at the Casa de Aswalda Cruz, uh, Fiocruz Cruz uh, RJ, Cermes III in Paris, resulting in the thesis, The Circulation and Application of Psychosurgery at the Psychiatric Hospital of Ducuri, Sao Paulo, Agenda Issue. Um, Eliza is currently doing a postdoctoral research project at the Casa de Aswalda Cruz on gender, violence, and psychological suffering in historical perspective. Um, Eliza's research emphasis in history and gender, women's writing, uh, history of science and health, and the history of psychiatry. Thanks very much, Eliza. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. I'm really very happy um, to be with you today, especially in this situation we are living. Um, so my name is Eliza. I am 34 years old. Um, I'm, a, I'm a historian, historian in Brazil. I have a fair skin. I'm blonde, uh, not natural, <laughs> not a natural blonde, but um, I'm wearing glasses and um, black t-shirt. So today I'll be presenting, um, let me share it. My paper, uh, Gender Violence in Life and Hospitalization of Female Psychiatric Patients in Brazil between the 1930s and 50s. Um, my presentation is a connection between my PhD results and my um, uh, postdoctorate research on gender violence and mental suffering. So, um, I have this picture of one of uh, the Jukery buildings on the PowerPoint. Um, so, in my PhD research, I discovered the history of a therapeutic technology that in many historiographical works around the world seem to be associated with the history of women, the psychosurgery. Considered the most invasive psychiatric therapy in the context due to, due to, the, to its possible after effects and personality changes, this therapeutic last resort was used at hospitals in all continents. Psychosurgery, best known now as lobotomy, has its origins marked in 1936 with Agus Moniz's prefrontal leucotomy. Developed, developed developed for all deviations incurable, incurable by other techniques, such as electroshock and insulin therapy. I investigated the, this therapy seeking to understand how psychosurgery has been appropriated and used in Brazil, in one of the biggest psychiatric hospitals in Latin America, Juqueri Psychiatric Hospital based in Sao Paulo. It was the first hospital to use this experimental therapy after its development in Portugal. 
According to research in clinical records, psychosurgery had been practiced on more than uh, 300 women there, which represented 95%, 95% of surgical cases. In that moment, Brazil underwent an, uh, an ideological context marked by the influence of uh, fascism, fascism uh, and eugenics, which influenced the policies of the new state between 1937 and 1945. Uh, ...of control and vulnerability of women admitted to Juqueri. But what did the medical records keep about their lives in and out of the hospital? I will uh, about the reasons for the hospitalizations and surgeries. So in my PowerPoint, I have uh, some parts of my presentation. This is the first case about Julia. These are fake names. Um, a, represent, a representative source of the forms of violence experienced by this wo these women between the 40s and 50s appears when the hospitalization of the patient Julia, aged 30 years, white and married, happened. Julia was discharged from the, from the hospital in 1940 to return two months later in 1941. She As a result, they separated. He stayed with the children and she returned to her parents' home who requested her hospitalization. The medical that that her situation, quote, somewhat apathetic and different new mental imbalance. Her reentry questionnaire completed by her husband informed, informed that after two months of dis discharge at home, she had been, uh, quote, again, striking with madness, unquote. Julia was diagnosed with a psychopathic personality. In late 1943, she underwent psychosurgery. Although considered as improved and feeling well and resigned, the incompatibility with her husband, in the, with her husband, in the words of the doctors, hindered the possibility of discharge. Julia said she felt lonely, saying she missed someone to talk and uh, talk to, and continued to be subjected to other treatments. One day, she drank a sedative and was found dead. An autopsy was re requested both for death verification and for the study of the brain, cut off by leukotomy. Um, the second case is from Lena. A Russian patient was admitted to 42 years old. According to the doctors, she was calm and informed, quote, having become um, weak in judgment as, as a result of such disgust, unquote. She arrived in Brazil at the age of 22, got married, and her husband drank a lot and mistreated her. Departing from her husband, she found in a second relationship with a Russian man another source of physical and psychological mistreatment. Lena said she preferred to, quote, be physically beating up to be cursed or offended as she was currently being. Unquote. She had insomnia, lack of appetite, she felt anguish, she was afraid of her home, she left the house aim aimlessly, she was ashamed, she didn't know why. She cried easily, feared that she was pregnant, and said that she had always um, tried to avoid children, having had eight abortions. For this reason, she expressed a feeling of guilty that com compelled uh, compelled her to kneel and ask the doctors for forgiveness. She was diagnosed with a depressive episode and a psychopathic personality. A report made by a nurse informs that the patient uh, wanted to work, but her husband would not let her, uh, saying that, quote, 
uh, she would go uh, she would go after men on streets unquote the patient uh, also says that quote her husband hospitalized her at UK hospitals unquote despite considered calm after this after the surgery she was categorized as chronic in 1956 and remained hospitalized until 1990. 1990. Um, for final consider considerations, um, we can reflect on the gender debates within the society and the psych psychiatry at the moment. Remembering the Brazilian psychiatrist Mario Young, an enthusiast of this therapy. Uh, at a hospital's meeting in 1933, Young stated that psychiatry is feminine and young. Being feminine, it is capricious and sometimes fickle. Because it is young, it, it, it still does not know itself well and maliciously entertains with our difficulties and doubts. But it will grow up and const constancy and tenacity will dominate its whims. Psychosurgery has react, reacted to debates and chains that have influenced gender structures, structures. And yet, although confined to the hospital under the medical uh, status of psychopathology, these patients' experiences are not just histories of victimization, but they are also histories of attempts at emancipation. To talk about this, uh, Trajectories is firstly to talk about the history of uh, social apparatus that have pathologized and treated these behaviors. Psychosurgery tried to treat, tried to treat problems caused by these episodes of violence, making women, whenever possible, calmer and more obedient. These are uh, words from the medical records. Nothing more troubling, especially to be considered at this time in which we live when women's lives still appear to be some, sometimes so insignificant and in a society marked by gender-based violence and feminicide crimes. It is also important to inform that the women mentioned here were classified as white, which also responds to ra racialist, political and scientific measures in that context in Brazil. This is reflected in the greater number of white women in the institution in the sense of selecting those who deserved a place of treatment within public hospitals. Some black and miscegenated women were also uh, were hospital hospitalized and underwent surgery. Most of patients operated on with a psychopathic personality within a scientific mentality that considered these women more inclined to addictions, including those of a sexual nature. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and your attention. And feel free if you have uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Liza. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I don't know anything about... Um, um, about I'm sorry. I, I think that I had a problem with um, the, the internet. Oh, it, it was it was okay actually. There was there was a few a few lags, but we we got the we got most of it. So that's absolutely fine. Thanks very much. Um, so we'll move on to our final speaker, uh, Louise Carimero. So uh, Louise is a final year PhD uh, in the French department of the School of Languages, Literatures and Cultural Studies at Trinity College Dublin. She is supervised by Dr. Sarah Allen Stacy and sponsored by the Claude and Vincinette Pichois Award. Uh, Louise has a double license of philosophy and literature from the Pan uh, Panthéon Sorbonne 2014, a master of French Renaissance literature, Sorbonne Nouvelle uh, 2016, and a master's um, in English literature uh, from the National University of Ireland Galway 2016. Her current research focuses on cynicism in French contemporary novels with the examples of uh, Frédéric Begbédé and Virginie Despentes. Uh, thanks very much, Louise. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, so to describe myself quickly, I'm a ginger girl with freckles. Of course, we see them now because it's winter. Uh, I have a dark green jumper 
and I wear glasses. And I'm sure from, your, from my accent, you understood I'm French. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about the cynical vision of psychiatry in the bonds by by Blondie. And for that, I'm going to share my screen. If it works, you know, yeah. Check, check, check. I don't know. Check. Where does that? Yeah, cool. And just give me one second because I need to access an app on my phone for the readings of the slides. So, uh, Virginie Despentes is a best selling author in France since the 90s. She is known for her blunt, trashy, and realistic literary style and her aggressive cynicism. In this paper, I would present my findings on the cynical portrait of the field of psychiatry in her book, Bye Bye Blondie, published in 2004. Despentes narrates the story of Gloria, a young punk in the 80s in France, misunderstood by her parents, not accepted by society. She uses anger and aggressive punk music to cope with the difficulties of being a teenager in the years of the recession. The psychiatric hospital to which she is sent without her consent seems to embody for Gloria heteronormativity and societal decorum. With cynical jokes, she tries to denounce the gender normativity imposed on her using medical discourse. The book seems to imply that psychiatric diagnoses are based on what is defined as normal at the time. The narration, which explains that Gloria lost herself and her hopes of being accepted in this forced confinement, criticizes the way psychiatric treatments and measures can go against the individual and marginalize them even further. To support my study, I will analyze three extracts from the book to highlight the vision of psychiatry expressed by Gloria. Each of them will be read, uh, and I have to thank my boyfriend for that because I wanted someone to read those extracts with a more neutral and understanding uh, accent. Uh, even though I love my accent, sometimes it's not the best to enjoy a narration. But first, very shortly, what is cynicism? When I talk about cynicism, I hear two things. There is the antique philosophy, a group of guys led by Diogenes who are criticizing uh, Greek society and mocking it. They were living outside of it. They chose to not follow its rules because for them they were fake and preventing us from getting happy. And then there is the more modern way to understand cynicism, which is a pessimistic, sarcastic, kind of despising attitude of someone who doesn't trust society and usually uses its uh, issues for one's benefit. We will see in those extracts that Gloria mixes a bit of both. So, for the extracts, I have organized them in three different sections uh, that I will uh, present one by one. So here we have the first section that is basically uh, about violence and uh, heteronormativity. I will let you enjoy the voice of my boyfriend. I'm just getting my phone ready, and here we go. In the dining room, they were sitting side by side watching TV. She'd cleared her throat and launched into a speech. Her father had said no without a second thought. Her mother hadn't said anything, just put on her martyred expression, meaning she couldn't bear Gloria to start making a scene. She'd insisted. Suddenly, her father got to his feet in a rage. He could see where she gets her habit of yelling like one possessed, trying to wipe out her adversary, knock him down, send him flying. He'd begun his usual rant, saying they'd had enough, with her mother going, you just don't realize. And then the first blow to punish her for insisting, followed by another to teach her to lie down when she was getting a hiding. Only then, for the first time ever, facing him, she'd pick up the chair and raised it to defend herself. Bad move. It made her father go absolutely crazy. She'd had some serious beatings in the past, but this one went beyond bounds. And in fact, it was the last ever. That he was a violent man was one thing. That he wanted to discipline her was another. But at no time did he actually want to kill her. Her father loved Gloria. That evening, she had tried to defend herself seriously, refusing to curl up in a corner, protecting her arms as she normally did. This time, she wanted to get past him, run away, and somehow managed to join Leo in Paris. A doctor had arrived, helped the two adults to pin her down, given her an injection. 
Cotton wool. At once her head was full of cotton wool. Then the house was full of firemen, and she was in a coma on the ground, surrounded by boots, waking up in a hospital, the psychiatric ward. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, so, this passage is interesting here because it depicts the authoritative and violent figure of the dad and the very submissive and silent figure of the mom. From the first paragraph, we can see that as soon as the dad gets a bit annoyed and a bit aggressive, she puts herself on the side and she stays in the position of the woman in silence. And that's something that it's important and we're going to see again in the next quote. Uh, the other thing that we can notice is how the violence of the dad is described in a blunt way. The words are very punchy and the reader can feel the beating. And I would say that for the three first paragraph, we agree with Gloria. We're like, oh my God, she's getting beaten by her dad. And we don't expect actually her to be the one being sent to a hospital. When it's uh, talking about that, uh, we can actually realize that uh, the words describing the dad are very interesting because there is the word possessed but also the word absolutely crazy, which once again showed to us that apparently the dad would be the one with the problem. And so it's very shocking to see that at the end, Gloria is the one uh, ended up going to an institution because she kind of broke the usual organization of the family and the norm of the violence belonging to the dad. The paragraph before last, when the doctor arrives, shows that the doctor becomes to her an enemy. He is not here to help her, but to force her to listen and calm her down. Even though her dad is not acting in an okay way, she is drugged like an animal. Society is against her. She is marginalized by the doctors and firemen who stand on the side of her parents without, without even trying to understand her. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the second quote. If it works. Is it working? Yes, it is working. Uh, once again, I'm going to have it read by George. John Dark Hospital, she'd been taken into the office of this handsome elderly man, graying at the temples, aged about 60. She imagined the Nazis exactly like him, calm, free of doubts, perfectly satisfied with themselves, sitting in elegant surroundings where everything was tasteful, clean and impressive. He didn't like her dyed red hair. Straight away, in the tone of someone competent who has spent time thinking about it, he'd announced that she wished to appear ugly and asked her why. Why did she do that? Didn't she know she could look quite pretty if she tried? Not a very promising beginning, in Gloria's opinion. She didn't think she looked as bad as all that. Not repulsive, anyway. On the other hand, she wasn't setting out to appeal to ancient psychiatrists with white hair. You can't please everyone. But this man was convinced that if she didn't look attractive to him, that was her fault. For once, hearing this, she resolved to keep her mouth shut. Why do you think you're here? I'm here because my father started yelling at me, and instead of keeping quiet, I answered back. Wrong again. You could tell right away from the old guy's expression. And in your opinion, why are you refusing to be a woman? Gloria decided to keep her answers to herself, because agreeing to be a woman means suffering in silence, not fighting back. Yes, you asshole, that's the real answer. She was surprised that someone with all these qualifications in charge of a hospital section should be so completely stupid as not to realize in 1986 that she was just going through normal teenage years and that there were far more distressing forms of rebellion than dyeing your hair a bright color. Thank you, George, again. So uh, this extract is from Gloria is in the hospital and she's waiting for a psychiatrist to see her to know if she's going to have to stay in the hospital or if she can live with her parents. From her sexuality, the doctor actually keeps asking her about it and she keeps refusing to uh, talk about it. So from her sexuality and her appearance, the doctor seems to judge her internal psyche. So basically, he judges a book by its cover. Gloria feels categorized as not suitable and almost as solid. The comparison with the Nazis is extremely powerful. She feels rejected and despised because she belongs to a different group than the old doctor. She is punished for being punk. The doctor represents a norm that she does not follow and so is not allowed to enjoy her freedom to be herself. And this we see in the second paragraph when she explains that she didn't dress for him. So in this way, she's aware that she cannot please anyone, but the doctor seems to not be aware of that. Moreover, 
Not only is the doctor a medical authoritative figure, he is also a representation of the male gaze. The concept of gender developed by a dot sorry, the concept of gender developed by the doctor can be linked to the studies of Judith Butler on performance. Butler indeed explains that genders are a performance from the outfit, the makeup, the actions and the attitudes. She says, I quote Judith Butler, a person only becomes intelligible through becoming gendered in conformity with recognizable standards of gender intelligibility. In this book, each deviation or exaggeration, for example, Gloria will wear makeup, but she will wear a lot of makeup. She's going to wear thighs and a skirt, but the thighs will have holes and the skirt will be super short, etc. So each deviation is seen, is very condemned by the adults first when she's young and by the rest of the society when she's older. For example, when she hangs out with friends of her uh, friend when she's uh, close to 40, they, none of them really like her and she's very uh, much depreciated by them. We can also notice in this extract that Gloria's comments, uh, they are the ones that are uh, put in uh, bold, um, about the situation seem much more mature and open-minded than the doctor's idea. She knows that you can't please everyone. She knows that uh, it's 86, so people should be more aware of modernity. Uh, she's also, by her comments saying, wrong again, um, showing how ridiculous the questions are because the doctor seems to not look to diagnose her, to know who she is. He's more looking to verify, to prove the cliches he has in his mind about her. So for her, the fact that there would be a wrong or right answer is not good. And we also see uh, that she's actually aware of the norms for women when she says that um, Gloria decided to keep her answers to herself because agreeing to be a woman means suffering in silence. And that's exactly what her mom did in the previous scene. Uh, la, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, so this passage shows how much Gloria understands her position as a marginal and how much the doctor is refusing to understand her. The mockery, but also her almost philosophical comments can help, her in, can help us in identifying her as a cynic. Indeed, as a cynic, she's mocking, she's using the issues of society to criticize it, but she also seems to choose to not live in it, if you see what I mean. She's keeping herself out of it. And many times when she's in the hospital, she's gonna refuse to participate to the activities or to tell the doctors what they want to hear. The stereotypes on which psychiatry seems to be based on are not only gendered, they are also social. For instance, Gloria insists on the fact that the therapist seems to assume and be convinced that all her problems come from drug and alcohol abuse or the fact that she comes from a family that is not rich. Lastly, I'm going to present to you a last extract where I, uh, that I wanted to use to broaden a bit the um, debate. And uh, it's a way to maybe that I would call punk versus psychiatry, but that's a bit uh, too advertising. Uh, so the idea for this extract, Okay, um, so in this extract, uh, we see the Gloria's father is visiting her after she has been uh, locked in the hospital for a few days and weeks. And is the first confrontation that she has with him. And she's tied up to the bed because she had a crisis when she started like going crazy because she was stuck. She didn't have her clothes. She didn't have her music. She didn't have her cigarettes. And for a 15 year old, uh, she was really lost. So I leave you again with George voice, check. Seeing him sitting by her bed as she lay there tied up, she could see his love, his anxiety, his unbearable pain. Her father was from Longwy, the son of a coal miner and from a large and poor family. He was a perfect example of social mobility under the post-war French Republic, the 1970s, education, meritocracy, and all the rest. For him, it was impossible to understand that she didn't want a nine-to-five job, that she didn't believe in his world. His generation had believed in collective progress, corresponding to the amount of effort you put in. They had 30 years of economic improvement, the so-called trente glorieuse. She was only 15, but she already knew, like many kids her age, that it wasn't going to be the same again. It wouldn't work out like that for them. 
punk rock was the first warning that the post-war world was in trouble, a condemnation of its hypocrisy, its inability to confront its old demons. She began to groan for lack of the right words, but she didn't yet know that he was weeping for the death of his daughter, the one who'd gone to Brabois Central Hospital on December 29, 1985, and would never come out. Another Gloria would take her place, pretending to be the same one, with pieces missing from her heart and a brain split in two. The psychiatric hospital seems also to be a good place for Gloria to realize how herself and her generation were not accepted nor understood by the generation of her parents. While she's trapped to her bed, her dad comes to see her and doesn't apologize, even if technically it's his violence who triggered her violence who put her there. This moment is actually the first time in the book when she terrorizes, terror, terrorizes, ter she thinks about uh, the beginning of uh, the punk movement. Here, Gloria is able to look at her dad and see him while the position of the dad suggests that it only sees a sick person instead of his daughter. The word warning to describe the emergence of punk rock is crucial here because it actually refers to a threat. For the parents, Gloria being in hospital is a warning for her kid to go wrong, while for her, punk rock is a warning about the fact that society is going wrong. This passage, to me, emphasizes how society is dysfunctional. Here, Gloria seems to hold a grudge against her father, who did nothing to stop the recession to happen. The reflection Gloria has here is very cynical towards society, as she, as she seems to point out the fact that even if her father did all he was told to do, worked well, married well, had a kid, etc., he is not happy. For her dad, Gloria is crazy because she does not follow the norm. For her, he is crazy to not understand the problems within the post-war French society. She wants more freedom than her mom. She wants to be allowed to choose her life. Here, Gloria insinuate, insinuates that the economy blinds citizens. They cannot see the hypocrisy, the inability, and the demons of capitalism. This extract here asks implicitly the question of who is the craziest, the man perpetrating a toxic norm or the girl trying to defend herself and exploding a bit too much to show it. To conclude, I just want to add a few more remarks about the book in general. So in these passages, Gloria appears to know what is good for her, even if she's only 15 year old and a teenage. However, later in the book, we will discover that being a punk and a hardcore cynic does not make her life easier. When she's 16, when she's 15, sorry, it's all fun and freedom. But when she approaches 40, she considers herself still punk, but the hopes and the fun seem to be gone since she is constantly broke, unable to fit in society. She cannot keep a relationship, she cannot keep a housemate, and she cannot keep a job. The book indeed is more nuanced. Even though the psychiatric hospital seems to be the first trauma of many, Gloria is not described as being completely happy and healthy. The point in this book seems to constantly question the concept of happiness, normality, mental issues, and their relation to money, job, family, housing, etc. Gloria is not seen as being happy, but neither are the other characters in the book. Most of them are uh, shown as, being, as drinking on the weekends to forget about their boring life, as smoking, taking drugs. They all try to escape the day-to-day -day life. For, uh, sorry, the one thing Gloria seems to have is the courage to say stop to this society and live accordingly to what she believes and not to make any concession. And this, for me, is very important to understand why Gloria here is closer to the ancient cynic. She's not only mocking society, but using it. She's not only criticizing your society. Like everyone, you know, who says, oh, being vegan is great, but I love meat while they eat meat. You know what I mean? So she is actually following what Diogen wanted. If you don't agree with society, you do the concession of living outside of it, and then you pay the price for sure. But you don't acknowledge this madness. So for me, the book actually asks, who are the mad ones? Thank you. Thanks so much, Louise. That was, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. And like already so many uh, dialogues across all three papers. So I think uh, we'll open it up immediately to questions. So if you've got any questions, um, please either raise your hand or uh, write it, uh, write your questions in the chat and we can come to you straight away. Um, 
or just turn your microphone on and and uh, and go for it. Um, yeah, Louise. Uh, I have a question uh, for Jamie. Uh, it's more about uh, maybe a more uh, to develop a bit more about the link between the double blind and the oppressed people. Uh, you quoted a woman at one point in one of your slides. Can't remember exactly her name. But uh, in Depend, for example, she makes a lot the link between uh, oppression and uh, mental issues. So I was wondering if you could develop a bit more. Sorry, my the tab kept coming over the unmute okay. button. <laughs> I, I was doing the ultimate for Zoom for paper. Um, uh, yeah, so hang on, what I'll do, because uh, thank you for that question, because that was sort of, uh, yeah, one of the bits I didn't really have time to um, dwell on. I'll put the uh, quote and the citation in the chat, um, because I think, I mean, it's I th it's a great, it's a great book. Um, and sort of that, this, the, the essay Oppression also kind of circulates as this essay called The Birdcage of um, Sexism. Um, and it's sort of, I suppose, what's really interesting about the kind of uh, what Marilyn Fry is drawing out about the double bind is the sort of notion that, um, like the very notion of choice becomes a trap. So, and, and that actually each choice that you can make is sort of part of the trap. So the sort of the image of the birdcage becomes this kind of perfect image of sort of, um, you know, each, each wire mesh of the birdcage sort of represents a choice that an oppressed person can make. Um, taken together, it's a cage. And then that also then becomes, though she has this kind of notion of uh, myopic perception. It becomes a means why oppression is not noticeable for uh, people who aren't oppressed, because they're like, well, you can choose to do differently. Um, why don't you just choose to do differently? So it's sort of, I, I think it's sort of about the double bind as something which um, is actually really hard to notice, but because it's sort of so, it's almost like a sort of transcendental condition of possibility of experience uh, for, for people kind of living within uh, oppressive societies. Brilliant. Thanks very much. We've also got um, Roxana uh, Donku who says, and then the only solution to the oppressed to escape the double bind is to become a cynic, which links both papers. I don't know whether... I agree with Roxana. Actually, I suppose actually then that, that yeah, I can... Uh, yeah, thank you, Roxana, because I, I suppose the question I'd like to ask you, Louise, is... is, is, is um, which I hadn't kind of... I was usually give myself more time to formulate questions, but like <laughs> about kind of... Um, I suppose this sort of these two ideas of cynicism that you draw out, um, and also I, about kind of I suppose the mixed reputation that cynicism itself might have. That I'm sort of thinking like uh, in the work of like Paolo Verno, where sort of cynicism is a kind of is an affect of the kind of like the night the also 1980s kind of finance financier or businessman. Like it's it's a, it's a disposition which kind of can can lead to cruelty and to kind of like the, the furthering of a, so it's sort of, are there kind of, is there, is cynicism sort of, it's not just escape, it's also kind of deeply harmful and like, yeah. 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 I mean, when I uh, defined cynicism, I did like only in two lines because I didn't have time to spend too much time. But uh, yeah, the idea of cynicism is about rejecting. And I think, it, you can reject in different ways. Uh, you can reject and propose instead. You can reject just to reject. Um, and also you can reject in a nice way. You can reject in a better way. You can reject in a very mean way. So I guess like in the point, usually cynicism uh, is linked to a very epidermic reaction, like something that's really like you, you just can't do it. Like in this book, Gloria seems to not be able to do it. She tries to mingle, but she just can't. You can feel the way it's um, described, even when she was like taking the chair against her dad. It is a sudden reaction that she can't impeach. She can't stop it. 
Mm. So uh, yeah, in that case, it's kind of a really a way to escape, but also maybe sometimes to reconstruct because if you're escaping for something else, like the bond doesn't necessarily give uh, an opening at the end, but doesn't say there is no nothing at the end. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, uh, yeah, if, uh, keep putting your questions in the chat. I don't see any other questions, but I think uh, Becky has a, a question. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pick some. <laughs> um, so uh, my question actually for my question for Louise, I was really interested in that quotation or that uh, section you showed where you have like that kind of subversive silent monologue um, of Gloria where she She's kind of almost like, yeah, like we, the reader, have the privilege of seeing her kind of silent back chat in a way to the doctor. Um, and I was just wondering that kind of like voice, does it continue throughout the narrative? And I don't know, in my own research, I found that there's a lot of the, which also to do with like, you know, representations of mental illness, they're all autofiction. And I was just wondering, is there any kind of like autofictional bent to um, this work by Dibont at all? Because it would strike me that that kind of like sort of, um, sort of subversive kind of patient voice just um you know questioning the doctor or at least like fatalistically predicting what they'll say and what they'll do that strikes me as something that comes from potential autobiographical experience so I was just wondering maybe you could talk about that if it relates to Dippon I'm not sure about the context of the writing of the book uh yeah I didn't have time to address it uh because uh, I mean Everything could be said in 15 minutes, so I had to make a choice. But yeah, uh, Depon's books are not per se autofictional, but they come from uh, her life. Like it's not her, it's not an autobiography, it's not events after events. But Depon did, did go to a hospital, a psychiatric hospital when she was young. Depon did run away. Depon was a punk. Depon was far from a um, uh, lower income family. So there are, a lot of uh, similarities between her and Gloria. And um, uh, about the internal dialogue, yeah, they're full of it in the book. And they're actually very funny because Gloria is very, um, how do you say that? Uh, ironic in her comments. Like, as you can say, when she was like, um, I, I cut a bit the, the code because it was too long, but at one point she addresses the doctor in her head, be like, hey, daddy, welcome to the new world. It's punk kind of, you know, taking, like mocking, taking the piss of people around her. She also does that when she sees the cues outside of a shop saying, oh yeah, guys, all, way, all bang the same shit. Like, wow, so original. Kind of this voice that you can actually hear in your head. And I think that this is pretty much what Depont also wants to show. I'm not sure because I never asked Depont, but there is a kind of thing about not being able to really voice yourself. So you think it for yourself. If you see what I mean, because Gloria can't really just like keep like insulting people. She does it, but then it backlashes. So sometimes she kind of stays a bit on the side, even if she's like kind of, you know, burning inside. Brilliant. Thanks very much. We've got um, uh, a comment from Ali uh, Murphy in, in the chat as well, who says uh, to both Louise and Jamie, Roxana covered, uh, un uncovered the link between the two papers, but I wanted to ask about the aesthetic element of cynicism and the double bind. Do you think something like punk or visible collective identity or specific identifiable tropes are integral to the cynic double bind, um, thinking through Spivak's definition specifically or identifying how it operates in women's writing, writing more generally? Yeah, I don't know who wants to uh, begin there. I'm just rereading it for myself. Sorry, just to, to, to make sure that I understand. <laughs> It, like, I suppose, I mean, I, I sort of, I, I'd sort of, I'd hesitate to kind of mark out a kind of an aesthetic form, I, or, or, or you're kind of sort of linking a, you're sort of linking an idea between aesthetic form and, and kind of, as well as kind of collective identity. I, I, I sort of, I suppose, like, it's that sort of, for me, it's kind of trying to sort of think about how how these sorts of texts try to work through intractable problems. Um, so whether that kind of produces a sort of a shared, I mean, this is sort of, I mean, you've, you've kind of 
landed on precisely like a problem that I'm trying to like <laughs> work out, but kind of like whether it kind of, you can then sort of stay, whether you can say this sort of, this is some kind of like style of the contemporary. Um, I, I don't know. And I, I suppose like that's sort of at the end of my paper and sort of gesturing to sort of illness writing as a sort of a genre, um, a genre perhaps kind of marked by this kind of dealing with a foreclosed set of possibilities um, and what that might mean about how it looks and how how kind of people sort of try to present themselves within life writing. Um, so that's a very randomly answer that that sort of would be, I want to kind of hear about punk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, to me, uh, if I understand well the question, like I wouldn't think that there is a special women cynicism or because, well, yes, I know it's a bit complicated, but there is not a cynicism that's like, oh, that's for women, that's for men. I guess that women talk in their cynicism about issues that maybe they know more than men about having to pay for pads, for example. You can be cynical about it if you're a woman way more than if you're a man. But for the writing style, there is one thing that is true is when uh, Depont arrived on the book market in France, she was a real bomb because she was the first woman to write with insults, with vulgar words, to talk about sex, pornography, masturbation, like all those things that usually normally uh, women writers tend maybe to not, not to not talk about, it, but maybe to do it in a more um, calmer way, I would say. Uh, so yeah, her first book was called Fuck Me. And because the word fuck was not okay for the States, they had to rename it Rape Me. But the idea was there. Uh, so yeah, I think that the, the link between the snake and the double bind is that you can't really say that there is a special cynicism, but that there are elements that could create an impression that there is. I don't know if I'm being clear, but um, that would be my idea. Definitely, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, we've got um, two questions for Roxanne. Uh, sorry, uh, two questions for Eliza now. Uh, one from Roxana and one from uh, Becky. So um, the first one from Roxana, uh, thinking of the description of the Russian patient, if the Brazilian doctors had an in-depth cultural knowledge of Russian culture, where abortion from an orthodox perspective is a major crime, where there is a saying that a man who doesn't beat his wife does not love her, etc., he would have considered her quite normal. Um, and then a second question from Becky. Uh, when and how did the female patient case studies, uh, histories you mentioned, become available? Are they now collected and available in a cohesive archive? And have they been used as part of a critical history of the psychiatric hospital? Thank you very much, uh, Roxana, for a comment. Um, in Brazil, I mean, um, I, I would just read again your, your commentary. Um, yeah, abortion in Brazil is, uh, is still a crime, and we are um, going through a lot of human uh, problems with human rights uh, for abortion in Brazil because um, it's linked not just to history of um, uh, Russian history, but it was also um, problems that, Brazilian women were living all the time. Most of the gender-based violence um, I can find in this medical records are conjugal violence or sexual abuses. So uh, it was kind of um, a, 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 um, a kind of violence really adapted to our reality in Brazil. So it was normal for normal uh, in the in the mind doctors in her society, but also here. So uh, she had, um, I think I described, uh, she was in two relationships, the first one with a Brazilian uh, husband and the second one with a Russian hus hus husband with the same kind of um, behavior, aggressive behavior against her. And uh, it's still a crime. And that's why they wrote about it. She was uh, always feeling very guilty about it. And in Brazil with the uh, Catholic culture where uh, until today, priests are against ab abortion and uh, interrupting abortion process in hospitals with women going through this process. Uh, it's really a very heavy, um, a very uh, heavy problem, culturally speaking, in Brazil until today and in this moment um, too. And um, I don't know if I 
couldn't uh, well you uh, you comment um, and uh, Rebecca uh, last year I tried to make a part of this document public in the um, in a platform, an online pl platform in Fiocruz, but I didn't have the, um, the consent from the hospital. They are very, I, I cannot, I, I quote, um, I was using fake names for these patients. In my thesis, um, which is still in Portuguese, but I'm writing um, a, an article in English, and I think it's going to be ready soon. Um, I'm using the uh, number of the files the, the this medical records and fake names, but I cannot publish the integrality of this this medical records. Um, I mean, to uh, to use them, I had I have this uh, consent from the hospital sen saying that I cannot publish her images or names or nothing personal. I cannot identify in this documentation the patients or the doctors only by publications. So it's very. I, I'm trying to make it known uh, in society in general, but um, I can also I can only sit and quote and make the references uh, of the uh, medical records numbers inside of the hospital. But it's a very complicated process to 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 get access to them. I mean, can I can I? I mean, what is that process like? How it, how did they? How did you get involved? Like, how did you get into the sort of the archive if, if they're kind of, if they're sort of so worried about the use of the archive? Yeah, this um, it's so serious in Brazil that especially in São Paulo last year, no, in two thousand nineteen, I think uh, they have this uh, decree, this law, saying that we cannot use medical records for uh, historical analysis exposing doctors and patients <laughs> because we can go to jail literally for one year and a half. Uh, it's a, um, a mentality that um, don't want to expose some practices inside of these hospitals. It's, uh, I really want to, to say it because um, in, 90, um, in, the, in the beginning of uh, the 20s here in Brazil, uh, um, uh, sorry, in 2000, um, Five two thousand six, 2006, um, we lost a lot of, uh, a, a huge part of the, this documentation, this documentation in Jukiri, uh, documentation from 1960, 60s. And we know that a lot of um, um, prisoners uh, from the dictature in Brazil were, were um, sent to, were sent to this hospital. So there's a lot of history inside of Jukiri that they, they really don't want to expose. And it's very complicated because uh, uh, these patients or these doctors' families are still alive. There's a lot of things involved. And there's, um, I mean, now I wrote an article about some um, artist patients who had their uh, artworks sent to Paris in 1951. And I could not even make relations between what um, 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 doctors or criticals of art were saying about these patients because I could not connect the the, uh, the the documentation numbers with their speech, with their analysis. So it's really very difficult for me even to 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 make deep evaluations because I know them, but I, I I cannot expose them. I'm always trying to find some ways to to be able to do it. I I sent my my project to to Jukiri in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning of the research, and I compromised compr myself to not inform names, uh, pictures from patients, from doctors. And then I had to go to another process in Brazil. We have these two um, process, one with the institution and another one in a national level. So then they gave me the permission to use it for my thesis. Yes. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's kind of uh, confusing, but um, yeah, it's really, it's a very closed space. I'm, I'm very uh, thankful because um, when I was doing my research, uh, some uh, employees inside of the hospital were helping me to find psychosurgery inside of the doc documentation. They want to help us to do our research, but we have this 
um, high highest level, which it's really complicated to to offer. I'm like, sort of like just sort of interested in like how I suppose. I mean, what is what is the point of an archive? <laughs> <laughs> and and like why I mean what are, and what is the hospital's relation to the archive and, and and the archive materials if they don't want it to be used there's sort of like a weird kind of tension there between sort of the archive as care as sort of testament to these patients that yes been through the system but then also a kind of a violence that they want to exclude but also care for I, yeah and just really sort of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but this is really sad. It's really yeah. sad because they are um, avoiding, they are really, uh, um, it's very difficult to make this kind of uh, analysis if you don't have full uh, authorization to use this documentation. I mean, like connecting with something uh, wrote about these patients, I cannot do it. So it's very limited. And uh, yes, uh, um, with medical records in Brazil, we have huge problems. Psychiatric uh, uh, archives in Brazil, we have. We have really um, big problems, especially if they are from like um, my documentations from uh, the 50s, um, 40s, 50s, and it's very close to 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 a moment now. They're not from a uh, hundred years uh, ago, so we can use them more um, easily. Thanks very much. Thank you yeah. for your qu questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and some co comments in the chat as well. Helen says, what incredibly challenging circumstances, Eliza, I really admire what you're doing. So um, I, I had a, a question about, uh, about the, this as well, Eliza, and just, just whether there are any, um, there's any information on kind of patient reactions to the surgery or, or how, what patients thought of before doing the surgery or, or kind of resistance to the surgery. Is, is there any recording of, of, of yes. that kind of reaction? Um, I have this wonderful case, which I, I would love to explore a little bit more. Uh, it's an exemplary case for me of resistance. We have some of them described in the documentation. They are not, uh, um, um, uh, they're not, um, um, we don't have a lot of descriptions about the reactions, but uh, there is this case, I wrote about it in my thesis, uh, an artist, um, a patient, which produced um, works of art inside of the hospital, and she, well, she was, uh, 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 she was a very bad girl inside of the hospital. She was in the place for bad uh, women inside of the hospital, this uh, building, uh, especially for those women more difficult to deal. And she, um, when she was indicated to psychosurgery, she, I, I don't know how to say this in English, she, uh, she uh, tears apart the, the paper indicating, uh, sending her to psychosurgery. And she escapes the psychosurgery. And inside of this document, we cannot prove that she underwent psychosurgery. So, so I think she really, uh, uh, she could make it. I mean, she 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 escaped this kind of uh, this therapeutic. She underwent other uh, kinds of therapeutic uh, therapy, like electroshock, for example. And this is so amazing. I cannot uh, um, uh, tell you uh, her name, but uh, in 1951, 51 years, I think, her uh, her uh, works of art were sent to Paris. And today, if you go to Santan Hospital, we have one of her um, um, tableau, um, her um, uh, paintings in the the exposition today, until today, in the, wow. in the exhibition until today. So if you <laughs> if you see this patient there, I mean it's a, a huge uh, case of resistance inside of the hospital. She leaves the hospital some years uh, later. And she's always uh, dealing with doctors, like she makes something wrong. And then she said, no, I just want to go out to smoke. She's really, she really communicates with doctors. Mm -hmm. Like she, she, she does something wrong. And then she said, oh, I'm so sorry for what I, for what I did. We have this writing mm -hmm. inside of her documentation, wow. asking the doctor forgiveness for what she did. So she's really negotiating with them. Thank, thanks very much. We've got one, one more, maybe one last question for... Um, Louise, uh, who, uh, from Nicola, who says, you said that Gloria is criticizing 
her own cynicism when she turns uh, 40? Is there a perspective of self-criticism from the psychiatry institution or from the father in Bye Bye Blondie? Um, it's actually a, an interesting question because, um, well, first, maybe I was not clear. She doesn't criticize directly her cynicism, but she's more uh, looking at herself in an objective way and being more like, well, okay, all of that and I'm there. It's more like this. It's more like, what am I now? And she's actually, for example, like kind of reviewing her point of view on medicine because at the end she uh, accepts to take deroxat, which is an anti anti antidepressant. Uh, but indeed, in the book, there is no self uh, critic of the um, hospitals or her father. If I remember well, I don't think she keeps a very good relationship to her dad. Uh, because since she's re from the moment when she's released from the hospital, she starts running away and living on the streets with like other kids that are punks and they prefer to hang out in like streets or malls instead of going back to their parents because they're not like recognized by the parents for who they are. But yeah, like the only, let's say a small step that is done from one side to the other is from Gloria saying, okay, fair enough, maybe I need help. Because that's the thing that's good about the book is that she, even if she was shocked by what happened to her towards the end of the book, she kind of realizes that maybe she, maybe society has a problem, but maybe also she might have also a problem. And that's why they're all colliding so much. But yeah, no, uh, the dad doesn't seem to, uh, the dad never apologizes. Like there is never an idea or a questioning from the dad about the fact that the violence may have been coming from him first. Uh, can I, do I have time to ask a quick question to Jamie? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's just because when you were talking about the different chapters or parts of the book of Susanna Cahollen, you were saying that there is one about the craziness, one about the diagnosis, and one about the convalescence, right? Mm. And I was wondering if the one about convalescence is positive or neutral or negative. Like, what does she mean by convalescence? Is there like a... Because like I was saying before with cynicism, like it, there is a rejection, but not necessarily something better coming after. So I was wondering in our book, does she address this kind of possibilities or? Mm. So I, in, in the language of, of uh, illness narrative scholarship, I think this, this in, in Art Frank's terminology would be a restitution memoir. Is it restitution? A rest what is yeah, the word? restitution is one restitution. of his things, so yeah. it, it sort of presents presents kind of it presents the experience as something that was fully recovered from um, um as kind of a you know a, a, a terrible nightmare that that Cahalen experienced and is kind of over uh and the book that's kind of where it kind of draws much of its kind of advocacy energy from is it's sort of like actually though there were sort of like pretty, pretty shocking sort of, um, uh, sort of medical misdiagnoses, Susanna was lucky in that kind of a doctor kind of noticed pretty early on in comparison to what, what else can happen um, to people. And there is sort of, I mean, there are all sorts of other kind of cases um, of this condition sort of uh, being left undiagnosed for far longer. Um, but I suppose, and that's sort of really the sort of the basis of kind of like what I was trying to draw out from it is actually this sort of this this performance of convalescence as sort of complete seems to be undermined by the existence itself. That there seems to be some kind of um, scarring or like trauma which 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 has to kind of be returned to, and that if the kind of this sort of this this unremembered memory of a sick month, um, you know, like, has it, to keeps, be, has to be like it, it keeps kind of the idea that even if you kind of went over something, your life is always kind of a cliffhanger. It's always like kind of it keeps on that. Yeah, it doesn't finish like oh now everything is cool. Let's move on. It's kind of always is this yeah 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 and I, and I think yeah and I think that notion of unfinished is like really really helpful because it's sort of it I mean I I and it, and I think it's sort of um 
I, I'm, I'm not going to be articulate enough to draw this connection smoothly, but I think the sort of, in part related to kind of Ben's interest in, in plasticity, there's a sort of, I mean, there's such a sort of like embrace of neuroplasticity in this, in this memoir. Um, and yet the kind of the embrace seems to also sort of be kind of actually then part of this real worry as well, this sort of sense that the kind of the work of neuroplasticity is never done. Um, and I, I think a sort of line I had, which I sort of didn't end up saying, is sort of everything affirmed in this memoir seems to then kind of undercut itself at another point. Um, so it's sort of why I've ended up getting so stuck on it <laughs> as, as a text and sort of trying to kind of uh, work out its grounds um, because it, I don't know, it's nothing ever seems to be as... Um, um, straightforward as the, the restitution narrative seems to suggest yeah. yeah thanks very much i think um uh becky's got uh, w uh one question i know we're a bit over time uh but i think uh, i think we, we're we're like we're good for a final couple of questions if anyone's got uh, anything else as well i think it's our last session <laughs> Yeah, you know, just, I'm just being very generous of myself, basically, sorry. Anyway, um, yeah, I had a question um, for Jamie, which maybe follows on um, from what Louise was saying about kind of like the narrative structure. Um, I was really fascinated by that kind of last part of your presentation where you showed like the use of multimedia and like the images in the narrative um, of like the notes and things like that. And I was wondering whether it kind of relates to that double bind of using the neurological um, and medical kind of terminology and discourse as a way and that double bind of that that need to kind of use a kind of academic or kind of like official discourse to communicate experience maybe in order to be accepted or read by mind doctors neurologists or what have you and I was wondering whether the images are part of that a kind of um sort of an adding of evidence in a way a sort of self-legitimation of what she went through like she's using the images like you are talking about the archive earlier in relation to Eliza's work, it, it's kind of like creating this kind of thorough, legitimate, evidenced patient history so that she'll be maybe read and accepted by doctors. So it's this kind of, yeah, is that part of the double bind? This kind of being like, look, 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 I definitely went through all of these experiences. Like it's official, look mm. all the evidence. Mm. I think there's definitely like an officiating process going on and, and like, I, I, I feel the sort of like the other impulse of this kind of invocation of the neurological is sort of the journalistic. And I'm sort of, it's something else that I kind of like, Susanna Cahalan is a journalist. This happened to her when she was a journalist. Her kind of experiences of um, her symptoms that were sort of presenting as psychiatric symptoms uh, threatened her livelihood. Uh, she like, there's a sort of in in part one there's this kind of uh this sort of well, her, her behaving erratically when she's sort of like into she's finally been given a big interview by the new yorker of some big hot shot like mayor candidate and sort of blows it and so there's a sort of like i think there's just like there's a real tension of like professionalism and like kind of um the sort of the images of of they they kind of they serve multiple purposes because they they not they don't just testify to like the illness they testify to this sort of like professional identity which I find quite <laughs> an interesting sort of dimension of like I suppose you know the 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 imperatives of behaving professionally are ones that I I guess well we all feel. Um, um, so yeah, that, yeah, I, that's that sort of probably the beginning of an answer rather than an answer. But, yeah. um, if there isn't uh, any more questions, I might be really, really cheeky and just have a tiny last one to James and and one last tiny one to Louise as well. I was just uh, wondering with with James, obviously, like um, you've mentioned plasticity, and obviously, like I work on on Malibu, et cetera, and I, I found your presentation fascinating. Obviously, this is really kind of different to the, to the narratives that Malibu talks about in, in that um, this is a first-person narrative of, of kind of brain changes and, and 
experiences of neurological illness, etc. Um, I don't know, just, just a general question of kind of how you um, kind of approach Malibu's work and, and because Mal Malibu kind of, when she, when she is looking at narratives of brain change, I guess very often she's interested in, in ones where the person has changed so radically that they can no longer say I, and they can, you know, like Phineas Gage, for example, who can't speak from the first person. Um, yeah, so um, obviously these are very different uh, types of narrative and just a general question of kind of how you approach that. And then um, just a very quick one to Louise as well. I was, uh, you were saying about um, cynicism as, uh, cyn sorry, cynicism as a uh, rejection, but sometimes also something that proposes something. So I was wondering whether there were any, whether you see um, uh, Despont as pr uh, proposing any positive future avenues for therapy and what would a kind of positive therapy or positive psychiatry look like for Despont? So on the sort of subject of, of Malibu, um, I mean, I, I, I sort of, I kind of, in a way I sort of, I mean, where I kind of land is that the sort of, the, the existence of these kinds of compositional strategies that people have to use can sort of unsettle Malibu's notion of neuroplasticity um, in that they kind of, I feel, well, I mean, for me, and I think this is unfair, actually this came up in my Viva, so uh, uh, like I think this is possibly an unfair critique, but like I, I, I think that the sort of sometimes the sort of the discourse of neuroplasticity can be presented as sort of, you know, automatic. That's, and that can kind of conceal the labour that lies underneath it. And that's sort of what I feel this book does, which is kind of like presenting everything as sort of like quite a sort of, ultimately quite sort of like a naturalised recovery when actually if you kind of dig a little bit deeper <laughs> underneath underneath each of the kind of the, the archival exhumations, you sort of find, uh, for instance, the sort of the clock drawing that I alluded to um, is, a, is, a, is a, as it sort of says in the text, is a, is a recreation and is actually a recreation that doesn't quite fit the description of what the, the text presents. So there's this sort of discrepancy between sort of, um, I suppose the sort of the, the the easy way that everything kind of comes together, and then the way that, um, yeah, again, this sort of like the the work the work of the work of the disabled person, the work of carers, the work of kind of hospital, kind of are, are actually sort of kind of complicit in this sort of neural network <laughs> um, when it kind of comes to the neuro neurological. But I mean, it's like. It's a sort of, yeah, it's a deep set of um, uh, implications, double binds that I'm in as well. That's really interesting. Thanks so much, James. I'd love to talk to you about that more at some point. Definitely, yeah. Uh, regarding the question you asked me, uh, I was actually listing the books that I studied for my PhD and just writing down what were the end of these books. And I'm sure as soon as I will tell you this ends, you're gonna answer your question. So the three first books, Baise Moi, Les Jolies Choses, Les Chiennes Savantes, the solution is to escape. For example, in uh, Baise Moi, Rape Me, the two girls go on a crazy killing uh, road trip like uh, Thelma and Louise. And like Thelma and Louise, they're like, let's, let's kill each other uh, to be free for real, etc. Unfortunately, they are brought back to reality. Um, one of them gets shot and the other one gets arrested. So their will for a new world doesn't work. In the two next books, it's the same. The idea is to escape. Uh, in one book, one can. In the other book, the, only, the one stays. So it doesn't really happen. Then there is three other books, uh, Teen Spirit, Apocalypse Baby, and Bye Bye Blondie. So uh, the thing that's interesting in Teen Spirit and Apocalypse Baby, it's at the end, the characters kind of found their team. Teen Spirit presents a guy who's alone, uh, with no one to help him and finally he finds out he has a, a daughter and so it's kind of team up, they learn about each other. But the book finishes with the World Trade Center attacks. 
So it's kind of the idea of a new world, but it's not really kind of a positive idea for a positive world that starts with the terrorist attacks. But at the same time, now they're family. And Apocalypse Baby finishes by a terrorist attack perpetrated by the main character uh, who blows herself up in the Palais Royal. And then the world enters in a main, in a big uh, world of like uh, uh, censorship, uh, propaganda, uh, um, how do you say, police state kind of. So once again, eh, not really happy ending. And then we have Bye Bye Blondie, where I think is the book that in a way presents the, maybe the most why not ending? Because at the end of Bye Bye Blondie, uh, Gloria, who's on the rock set, which helps her, but she's not really sure about it because she's kind of like, eh, I don't know. She has a massive fight with Eric, which is a love, the love of her life that she met actually in a psychiatric hospital. And they have a brick fight and she walks in the streets of Paris all night long thinking about what she's going to do, which is like, fuck that, fuck that. And then she ends up coming back home and he ends up inviting her to bed. And that's it. The book finishes on this like, kind of small note of like, we're fucked in the head, but we're fucked in the head together. Sorry, I'm saying fuck a lot. Sorry. Um, sorry for my English audience. Um, but um, yeah, they kind of like kind of create a bubble or safety, even if they're not really well fit for the world because the world hasn't changed. But at least they're together. Even if they're not perfect, something works. So it's not really proposing something better for the future. But at least it doesn't necessarily end with death. That's like the least hopeful message I can say. Um, <laughs> I find that quite hopeful. I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's positive. I, I think that's a positive, positive enough note to, to end on. <laughs> but thanks so much uh, to all three of you today. That was an absolutely brilliant way to end the, the seminar series. And um, yeah, thanks so much. And thanks uh, so much to everyone for joining us. And to those of uh, you that have been here kind of week in, week, week out at the seminar series. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you kind of uh, follow the seminar series. And yeah, I don't know whether um, you want to say anything, Becky, it's just, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to really miss it. Yeah, like just thank you. Like, it's crazy. It, it was really cool, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I re reiterate what Ben said. Yeah, ditto. Just thanks to all three of you and your papers, like, you know, meshed really well together. It was really lovely to see and got some really positive questions or maybe negative in the end. I don't know. <laughs> positive, negative. Anyway. And yeah, it's been, it's been, yeah, it's been emotional. There we go. What, who's that? That's from a lock, stock and two smoking barrels. Anyway, what's his name? I can't remember. Anyway, I'm babbling. It's been emotional. It's been great. <laughs> the seminar series. So yeah, thank you. And I, yeah, I reiterate what Ben said, like, keep on seeing the same names coming every week. So thank you to the faithful for coming along and, and <laughs> seeing what's going on with research. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and everyone, uh, we look forward to welcoming you back, obviously, at the, at the summer conference, uh, July 29th to July 31st. So we'll be having, um, you know, parallel panels, workshops, keynotes. So hopefully um, kind of find the same energy again there and really looking forward to um yeah picking up again on the same theme and yeah okay thanks everyone <laughs> thank you very much have a great evening everyone see you soon